and uh, 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 the details which I talk about are not something that uh, that is pulled out of uh, the American experience or something like that. These are very true Indian experience. I think that's what is most important. Okay, because we are not talking about something what others have done, but rather about what we have done. I think that's the most important thing. Okay. Right. So industry definitely requires this kind of CFT. Now, how about academics? Okay. Whether the academicians uh, require this kind of CFD? Yes. Okay. Industrial CFD requirement would be on a continuous basis because the program demands that the CFD is used continuously. Whereas the academic research programs in terms of uh, using this, this kind of high performance computing platforms, because we are not talking about uh, a continuous demand, the usage may be sporadic, but definitely there is a requirement for that such kind of a CFD. I think that is very, very important. Now, I just wanted to sort of distinguish between what happens in the industry against what happens in research. I think that's the most important thing that we should understand even before we uh, understand the use of uh, CFD. And, or uh, understand the use of uh, CFD uh, in the context of high performance computing platforms. Okay. Typically, when I'm talking about uh, the industries, okay, they require what is called as RANS or in the present day, what are called as the detached eddy simulation kind of solvers. Okay. Right. So they require RANS or DES solvers. Uh, so, uh, I just wanted to uh, tell that if somebody wants to uh, raise the hand, you can raise the hand and ask questions. Okay, please feel free to do that. Uh, the simple reason is I am looking at only the screen which, which I am sharing. Okay, the other part of it I am not uh, seeing. So, um, I leave it to the organizers to sort of chip in and uh, stop me and then uh, uh, makes to make people take questions. Sure, sir. Sure. Okay, sir. Okay. Right. Uh, so basically, um, uh, right. <coughs> when I'm talking about typically all calculations associated with the industry, they which require high performance computing are the RAND solvers. Okay. Like for example, the high lift calculations I talked about. Okay. RANS, I suppose most of you know that it is what is referred to as a Reynolds average Navier-Stokes equation where the turbulence is modeled. Okay. Now, you one of the other versions of France which is becoming more and more popular today is what is referred to as detached eddy simulation. Detached eddy simulation. These are, uh, uh, in terms of fidelity, uh, uh, they, they, they are uh, uh, better than the RAND solvers. They are in a better position to capture flows which are actually separated, but they also have their own limitations primarily because there is a modeling associated with the, uh, the modeling associated uh, with the turbulence, uh, uh, turbulence, okay? So whenever there is a model, there are some limitations, but however, they are very useful tools, very useful tools. Typically, this is what industry would be interested in. On the other hand, when I am talking about uh, the academics, the research kind of environment, you can see that yeah, there are a number of people, even within the country, making use of what is called as uh, DNS, which is direct numerical simulation or direct numerical simulation of the Navier Stokes equations, okay, whichever way you want to call it. So, what is the difference between the RANS and the DNS kind of solvers? In the RANS, you model the turbulence, whereas in DNS, you actually do not have any model. You just solve the uh, Navier-Stokes equation on an extraordinarily fine uh, grid uh, on uh, very, very small time, uh, time steps uh, comparable with the turbulence uh, uh, time scales and solve the problem. Okay, so essentially these are two ends. Okay, and one of the important reasons why DNS is not used in the industry is that the Reynolds number typically associated with the industrial flows can be very large. Okay, for example, the example of high lift flow that I showed, the knowledge number could be anything like 30 million uh, or so. Okay, on the other hand, you can also have other examples where you may have to deal with 100 million knowledge number also. So as the knowledge number goes up, 
the kind of grid resolution that is required in the DNS is also formidable. And therefore, it does not really make big sense to make use of DNS in an industrial environment. On the other hand, in a typical academic research environment, and more so about those guys who are interested in aspects of turbulence and uh, turbulence physics and so on and so forth, DNS is a very good option. And that's what happens in the country. Okay, There are people who work on aerodynamics and academics. They would still make use of ranch based solvers. But on the other hand, there are also people who are actually uh, interested in physics of turbulence. They would make use of DNS kind of solvers. Okay, and uh, that, well, well, so that that's what typically happens. And when I am really talking about high performance computing platforms in an academic environment, research environment, I think DNS is one of the very very important options. You can also have RANs, but I would say that DNS is one of the important options. So what is the difference between the kind of flows that are handled in the industry uh, as against the flows that are handled by the academicians? The, in the industry, typically you talk about very large Reynolds number. I gave you an example of 30 million volume, uh, the 30 million uh, Reynolds number. Whereas here you talk about typically low Reynolds number because uh, you cannot handle higher Reynolds number with the DNS kind of tools. Okay. And what is so basically whenever you ask the question, somebody does a computation, there is an expectation from that computation. What is the expectation the uh, pe people have from the industry? They want to really calculate the air loads, the coefficient of lift, coefficient of drag, the flight parameters, right? So uh, 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 this is, uh, this, uh, um, the lift curve slope, right? and uh, uh, the stability parameters if somebody is uh, uh, you know exposed to aerospace uh, a, a flight mechanics kind of scenario the stability parameters so this is all this is what industry would want on the other hand an academician would want uh, uh, understanding the physics associated with the flow as i told more so it is actually understanding the turbulence physics and why should you understand turbulence physics? Because this is what you actually sort of put back into the uh, models. Okay, previously all the turbulence models were based on uh, experiments in the lab. On the other hand, today you have more and more models directly resulting from the DNS or the direct numerical sim uh, simulation kind of solutions. Okay, and therefore understanding the turbulence physics is important. Why is it important? Because after all, I want to model the turbulence uh, in the flow so that I have better tools for my industry. That's the purpose. Okay. And now, uh, what kind of uh, tools with the industry guys would like to make use of? They are general purpose tools. Okay. General purpose tools in the sense, the examples that are going to come. Okay. They're, they are also going to talk about the general purpose tools. General purpose tools, what it means is that. Uh, the, the, you know, I don't have a separate tool which would solve, say, flow past a missile, flow past a uh, 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 civil aircraft, flow past a combat aircraft. So there is only one tool which does all this. Okay, and uh, in general, you can also presume that uh, it handles the complexities associated with the geometry, complexities associated with the flow. Right. So. This is what the industry guys are interested in. On the other hand, you can see that many of the research tools are even Cartesian or maybe in the cylindrical polar coordinates. Okay, so they are not general purpose in that sense. They will be so they may be a tool which is just generated for simulating a wall boundary layer, turbulence associated with a wall boundary layer. Okay, so they are very, very specific tools which are not general purpose. And uh, why do we do that? Because you require higher uh, accuracy in the DNS kind of solvers, which is possible only with, uh, only with uh, such limitations. Okay, I'm not really getting into the details. Okay, and as I told you before, uh, industry guys would be interested in very complex geometries. Okay, I, I can give you, for example, the high lift geometry itself is reasonably complex, uh, but I can show you more, uh, more of them possibly. Okay in the slides to come, right? Whereas uh, the research tools are all very simple geometries. It's like a hexagon or a 
flow in a pipe and uh, kind of a scenario okay not not always but i am giving you example which pertains to the use of high performance computing okay if somebody is not interested in high performance using high performance computing then he, he he may have a different way of handling it so i want you to sort of uh, 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 clarify that whatever distinctions that we are talking about as of now is in the context of hpc okay now what is one of the primary demands that uh, the, uh, on the uh, on the industrial tool it should be robust okay now uh, why the industrial tool should be robust i think that's a very important question industry guys would not like a tool which is not robust okay why that's because uh, the the in the present day in the present day one of the key words in the use of cfd for industry is process automation automation okay their cfd calculation should be done in an automated fashion okay so basically you define a geometry right aircraft geometry maybe on your katia kind of tool and uh, what you have to do is that present it to your flow solver so flow solver would automatically generate the required grid for the geometry it will automatically generate the solutions at solutions for uh, say for example various alphas and betas automatically so you are really talking about large scale computations happening without human intervention okay so in this kind of a scenario for example when a flow if the flow solver is not good enough in uh, handling high alpha kind of uh, scenario the high angle of attack scenario right where the flow is separated and so on and so forth right what happens is that uh, the code would break down okay so it will just break down it will it will the code would hang the computer would hang it won't go right so this is not good for process automation so when i'm saying that robustness is a key criterion what it means is that robustness is extremely important from the process automation point of view okay on the other hand what is important for the industry uh, for the academic research dns kind of calculation is accuracy okay it is accuracy is very very important now the question anybody would ask is that is accuracy not important for uh, 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 the industrial calculations it is important okay but the the one the requirement that would sit in the driver seat is not accuracy it is robustness okay on the other hand for the research tools the one that would sit in the driver seat is accuracy robustness is also important for the research tools also it's not that it is not important but the the primary requirement is robustness for the industry and accuracy for the uh, accuracy for uh, the research tools okay now Uh, in terms of uh, what is the biggest challenge okay that one has in acquiring a tool of this kind okay as far as the industrial tool is concerned the biggest challenge is what i would call as an algorithmic challenge okay so to what happens when you really talk about rand solvers is that your problem becomes very stiff okay um uh, what i mean by you know if somebody has done a rigorous course in uh, ordinary differential equations he would understand what i mean by stiffness okay so typically what happens is that when i you know in cfd you talk about what is called as a grid induced stiffness okay what it means is that there are some cells which are very small and there are some cells which are very large okay so you can show that the time step that you can choose for cells which are too small okay it becomes very small as against the cells which are very large where the time steps are also large okay you can say that your uh, delta t goes like the spatial resolution of a given cell okay therefore what happens in my computational domain typically when i am talking about a rand's problem i have to resolve what is referred to as a laminar sub layer okay in a turbulent so if somebody is knows about uh, turbulent flows and law of the wall and so on and so forth he would immediately understand what this laminar sub layer is okay so this is why the y plus people always talk if you talk about the y plus requirements um, uh, okay if you are aware of that so what it means is that 
in order to capture the high gradient of the flow on the wall, high gradient in the sense it directly gets reflected as high shear stress, the frictional uh, resistance of the surface, right? High gradient on the wall, I require uh, 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 at least one point or at least two points within this so called laminar sublayer where there is a linear variation, okay? So this is from the law of the wall. So what is important is that I have to place a point which is very close to the wall. Now, to give you an idea as to how close, okay, I may have to keep uh, uh, keep uh, uh, the first point of the wall in the normal direction could be anything for a high Reynolds number flow. It could be like a micron, okay, 10 to the power of minus 6, okay. Now, you also know the uh, the uh, the uh, what I would call as the streamwise di dimension of an airfoil. You can typically put it about a meter, okay, right? And uh, uh, so basically, uh, you can immediately see that uh, about a meter. If I am resolving it with about uh, a thousand uh, a thousand uh, points on the surface, okay, in the streamwise direction, typically you can very quickly realize that the aspect ratio of the cell that I am dealing with is about you know 10 to the power of uh, that is about a micron and this is about one over uh, uh, a thousand okay because I have uh, that's the kind of resolution that, that I have chosen an, uh, along the cardwise direction okay so you will see that the aspect ratio is something like 10 to the power of three okay so in a typical 2d calculation you have aspect ratio about 10 to the power of 3, 10 to the power of 4. And when I also bring in a spanwise dimension, okay, which is the calculation associated with the wing, this may be something like a million. Okay, that's the kind of aspect ratio associated with the volume. Okay. Because of this, you will very quickly realize this brings in what is called as a grid-induced stiffness. The time step that this volumes, which are immediate sitting immediately next to the wall, the time step these volumes would allow is so small as compared to the vol uh, the volumes which are far off from the wall and as a consequence of that your uh, your uh, cfd process becomes extremely slow okay now what you have to do is that so what is the way out you have to build algorithms okay which sort of overcomes this grid induced stiffness problem which means that it also takes care of the robustness it also takes care of the accuracy so this is the kind of challenge okay on the other hand typically in a dns kind of a scenario you do not have uh, what i referred to as a grid induced stiffness okay typically you will still make use of, of uh, grid which are as ratio which there the scaling up right so you may have to use a billion volume or even more in your dns calculations and therefore, it is a. It is not just a billion volumes. You. It is also you have to capture the uh, transient physics accurately. So you are also talking about large data, and you have to do the post processing for that. Okay. So the prompt, the, the, the challenge there is not about the algorithm that you develop, but rather about scaling up the problem, acquiring the data, post processing the data, using the post processing post process data for understanding the physics. I think that's a challenge. Okay, for example, what happens? I know in uh, Stanford University they have what is called as uh, Center for uh, Turbulence Research. Uh, uh, so you can you will see that there is uh, some postdoc who will sit and generate uh, uh, large scale data, and there will be some other postdoc who is employed for just looking at the data. Okay, so essentially that's a very very common thing. So the the the, the challenge for industrial CFD is very different from that of a uh, uh, academic or a uh, research uh, CFD. Okay, so what is the difference in the computing platform that would that is required? Okay, so I would say that uh, in the industrial CFD, uh, it is called as uh, capacity computing, as against what is called as a capability computing in uh, in um, uh, in a research-based platform. So when I am talking about capacity computing, it is good for uh, industrial CFD. I'm just giving you, these are not hard numbers, but uh, some ballpark numbers, okay? If you have a machine with about, uh, say, 1,000 cores, okay, 1,000 uh, 
Intel CPU cores, okay, 1000 or 2000, I think that's considered good enough for, uh, for industrial CFD, okay. This is for one problem. So the reason why uh, uh, different slabs go for 11 petaflop uh, machine is that uh, they don't deal with one problem at a time. They deal with multiple problems and all of them put together, they would require a very huge computing platform. But still the nature of computing is, uh, uh, is capacity kind of computing. As against in uh, academics, it is capability computing. So typically academician would require anything like 15,000 cores or 20,000 cores in fact, that's again an understatement. Okay, there are people who use make make say like for example in the CTR I was talking about the Stanford University people make use of anything like hundred thousand processor cores. Okay, so very large computing platforms, very large computing platforms. Okay, so now in terms so basically having discussed the industrial CFD as against the uh, as against the uh, academics, we should also know like uh, uh, what is the present status in the country okay as far as industrial cfd is concerned all of you very, very you know all of you know if i'm talking about fluent or many of the other commercial tools okay you know all of none of them are developed within the country okay so there are very very few examples very, you know very very sporadic developments you know there are a couple of developments in drdo labs and a couple of developments in the space organization and that's all about it Okay, if somebody asks whether we have developed a general purpose industrial tool, CFD tool, which, which can routinely be used in the industry, you hardly have any examples. Okay, I'm again telling you, this is a nat national context. That's what I am talking about. I'm not saying that people are not using uh, Fluent. Okay, there are, most of us uh, make use of Fluent so much uh, that CFD is called as uh, uh, computational fluid fluent dynamics you know that's the kind of statement people make okay it has become so commonplace okay so if you ask a question whether we do do we have an industrial tool which is uh, um, uh, uh, which is uh, uh, which is general purpose robust accurate which scales well okay there are hardly few examples okay in, in my view uh, I would say that even those examples are incomplete as against the, for the research tool, you can see any of these IITs or IIC, you will have at least about three to four DNS codes in each one of these places. It's very commonplace. So very obviously, the question that comes in our mind is that, okay, how is it that we are developing so much of uh, DNS-based solvers, okay, as against the so-called uh, RAN solvers, why we are not able to? Uh, the key answer to that lies in the fact that um, the, 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 the challenge that... I talked about the algorithmic challenge that is there in the RAN solver is formidable. So somebody should really understand the algorithm, uh, the numerics that goes behind the RAN solver, RAN tool, uh, 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 in very deeply in order that he develops a, uh, uh, a general purpose, uh, robust, accurate, uh, scalable CFD tool. So that's where the difference is. To develop a DNS tool is very, very not, I would not say easy, but it's not that difficult. So the challenge is more in terms of scaling it up, okay, which we seem to have done. But in terms of the industrial CFD, we don't have, unfortunately, several tools which are which have been developed. Okay. So there are very, very few tools which are developed, and they're also incomplete development. So that is where that is in that context, what we have done in the computational aerodynamics lab becomes important. Okay. Now Finally, I, I will I'll talk about the hyphen solver. Just hold on one minute. I'll, I'll just come back. I think uh, just a minute. I'll take a break and then I will again start. One.
<laughs> Sorry. Uh, so I will get started again. Okay. Yes, sir, so, yes, so what uh, in the in this context? Okay, what is important is that I wanted to introduce you what we have developed as a hyphen solver. Okay. So this is a, a solver uh, that's developed in the computational aerodynamics lab, and uh, it uh, is very very extensively used uh, today by our defense and space organization okay it's very extensively used okay so pop as i uh, uh, i would tell that this is uh, this code uh, uh, is typically suited for uh, aerospace and kind of automotive uh, automotive uh, automotive uh, aerodynamics okay and uh, i have listed some of the features that are available in the solver first thing is that it is a general purpose solver okay so when i am saying it's a general purpose uh, uh, industry standard CFD solver. Um, I, I'm sure that with the kind of background and introduction that I have given, people would appreciate that what is important for this is algorithm. And uh, one of the important uh, areas where we actually work in computational aerodynamics lab is on CFD algorithms. Okay. So what we have done is all the, you know, it is just, it's not just for, uh, we don't work on algorithms for fun. Okay. We want to have an end product. I think that's the basic uh, uh, driving force behind what we do. So we work on algorithms and uh, arrive at algorithms which are uh, uh, good, which are meant for the general purpose solvers. And not just that, we immediately, once we have something very interesting, we immediately sort of uh, assimilate those ideas into this solver, hyphen solver. So basically, if somebody looks at the present capabilities of the solver, it is not something that has happened overnight, okay? In fact, I would say that we started developing the solvers, solver way back in 1998, and this is a continuous effort over the last 20 years of several PhD students, MTech students, MSc students, okay? So all of them have actually sort of continuously worked on these methodologies, algorithms, assimilating it in the hyphen solver, and now there is a wing which is actually completely looking at the development and the maintenance of the hyphen solver, okay? So this solver is meant for aerospace and automotive uh, uh, industries, okay? And what kind of capabilities it has? It has uh, RANS, URANS, detached data simulation, kind of capability for the compressible flows, okay? And uh, what kind of uh, uh, mesh topology it permits? Uh, typically, I would say that uh, this methodology is based on what is called as an unstructured mesh uh, calculation, and uh, it allows using hexahedral mesh, tetrahedral mesh, prismatic mesh, pyramidal mesh, right, mesh elements, and or any of these things can also be in combination. Okay, so people call some people call it as uh, what 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 people call as a grid transparent. Uh, algorithm okay so i think uh, this is uh, something that is al already available in the solver it also has uh, things like the moving mesh overset methodology right sliding grid like for example when i am talking about moving mesh uh, one of the calculations that we have uh, made is uh, uh, like uh, uh, you know what is called what we call as a dynamic ground effect okay it is simulating uh, the uh, the entire uh, uh, trajectory of a wing, okay, char aerodynamic characterization of a wing in landing. So there is what is called as a, uh, a 50 feet obstacle. And uh, from then on, what happens is that the wing comes in the ground effect. So there, there are different operations. There is a glide operation and then afterwards there is a... Uh, uh, flaring, then deflaring, touchdown. So basically, from the time it starts gliding from out, uh, you know, out of the ground effect till the time the touchdown and the spoilers are deployed. Okay, so entire sequence of the uh, the landing of a uh, wing. Okay, landing of a wing is computed using the hyphen solver. Okay, so you can actually, for those people who are interested in aerospace in engineering, aerodynamic kind of scenario. Okay, they can actually uh, go give a Google search and look at dynamic ground effect and uh, hyphen, you will get our uh, publications in that area. Okay, very, very interesting. These are what are called as moving grids. 
So these are not very commonplace calculations. That's the reason why I'm giving it as an example. These calculations wouldn't have been possible without uh, use of high performance computing platform. I think that is again the reason why I'm giving such examples. Typically, overset bids are uh, used for uh, things like the store separation. Like, for example, when you have a combat aircraft and uh, the missiles or bombs or, uh, or any other store, it separates from the, uh, from, the, uh, from the parent aircraft, right? People would like to know the safety of this separation, okay? So that uh, the essential idea here is that the store that uh, separates should not tumble and then hit the parent aircraft itself, okay? So I think uh, uh, the, uh, the uh, for example, the Air Force, okay, would be interested in uh, such a study where uh, they would like to sort of ensure the uh, safety of the separation of the store. The store could be anything like a missile or a, a bomb or whatever it is. So there you make use of the overset methodology. And then sliding grid is uh, typically like if I want to make a calculation uh, for calculation uh, um, for a propeller aircraft, okay? So essentially you have a sliding domain which is associated with the propeller, rest of the domain is stationary. So, uh, so basically I should say that the 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 store separation capability of hyphen solver is something that is which is very well established okay. used by our defense industry okay and as far as sliding mesh calculation is concerned at present there is a big program in my lab um, uh, which is actually uh, looking at uh, one of the propeller uh, aircrafts it's it's, well, it's it's referred to as HTT 40 designed by HAM. So basically, there's a large program which is running in my lab where we are actually looking at uh, the so-called propeller sli slipstream effects, okay? Propeller slipstream effects uh, using the hyphen solver. So uh, when I am actually listing something, uh, again, I just want to emphasize that it is not that we have pulled out from the literature and then inserting it. You know, every word that I am actually saying is actually implemented and used extensively in the country. So I think that's a very important thing that we should always remember. It has got a solution adaptive capability. I'm not getting into the detail. It also has what is called as an adaptive time stepping. Typically, when you are using a unsteady kind of a calculation, it uses implicit time integration, which is what gives it the robustness. And more importantly, it is parallel. When I'm saying parallel, um, uh, there is a parallel algorithm that we have actually designed for this uh, code and these parallel algorithms are very good and these are very well known throughout the world that what, the, what we have uh, designed something these are very well known throughout the world and uh, as the in the examples that I'm going to give you would very quickly realize how good the code is in terms of scalability I think that's what is going to be the focus of the next part of my talk okay there are two kinds of parallelism that people always talk about. One is called as the distributed memory kind of a parallelism, okay? Where uh, uh, what it means is that I, I have a, a typical CFD problem. What I would do is that uh, what, what people call as SIMD, okay? The single instruction multiple data. So essentially I have a large computational domain. I will break the computational domain fragment the computational domain in into as many processor cores that i have okay like for example if i have 10000 cores and i have a, a grid with about 200 million volumes i will break it up into 10000 domains and each domain will be mapped onto a processor core and all all the cores will be doing the computation concurrently okay so that's why it's called as a parallel computing so this is what comes under the so-called mpa kind of a framework so here the challenge is decomposing the domain into 10 10000 fragments okay i think uh, even if you do it you should do it in such a way that uh, there is what people refer to as load balancing in the sense like when you fragment it okay this is not a structured domain this is an unstructured domain when you fragment it, it should not so happen that most of the load goes on one core and very small load goes on the 
other core, which means that the core, core which has got a larger computational load will keep working, whereas the other core, other core which you are which has got a smaller computational uh, load will start sleeping. Okay, that's a very ineffective way of using a parallel computing platform. So basically, what is important is that we decompose the domain into smaller fragments uh, so that there is what is called as load balance. Okay, so all of the co computational cores, right, processor cores should get almost equal computational load. I think that's very important. The second thing is that are these uh, computations going to happen uh, uh, just concurrently? No, it is not possible because you are talking about solving a single problem, which means that there will be data dependencies. Okay, the data uh, to run a code on a given core would require data from other cores. Okay, so this is what is called as the communication, which means that the 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 processor cores not just compute, but also they have to talk to one another. So when they say that they have to talk to one another, uh, when I am typically fragmenting the problem into a large number of cores, it can happen that the talking becomes so much that the efficiency of the solver suffers. Okay, So this is what is called as communication bottleneck. So this is again another major uh, issue in terms of the uh, uh, in terms of the uh, uh, MPI based parallel course. Okay, so now fortunately for us, there is an open source uh, kind of a tool, Metis, which does this job fairly efficiently for the kind of problem size and the uh, machine size that we talk about. Okay, so we make use of that. The Metis is what we make use of. But more importantly, we should, you know, although you divide your computational domain, satisfying the load balance and the communication overheads uh, requirements. Your solver also should be in a position to effectively uh, exploit the benefits that the load, uh, the the metis or the any other uh, domain de decomposition tool would give you. So I think that's what we have worked on as far as the parallel algorithms are concerned. Okay, so I think I'm going to give you more examples from the uh, uh, the so-called distributed memory parallel algorithms very soon. The other one is what is referred to as a data parallel algorithms, okay? So what happens is that when I'm really looking at, uh, this is what people refer to as uh, multi-core and many-core, okay? So uh, the, the Xeon processor cores, uh, I, if I'm right, the, the most recent version, the so-called Cascade Lake, has got anything like 22 cores, okay? 22 cores, 22 or 24, I may be wrong on that number, 22 cores or 24 cores. They call it as uh, uh, so there's a new version of the Cascade Lake, which is available, okay? So uh, this is what is referred to as uh, multi-core, okay? On the other hand, when I'm really looking at the accelerators, I, I, I'm not sure how many of you really know the story of the accelerators, okay? These accelerators were uh, uh, developed uh, uh, for uh, for the purpose of graphics rendering, okay. So the so-called VGA kind. So more from the graphics rendering part of it, and uh, they found that uh, in order that the graphics is rendered faster and faster, these people sort of uh, made uh, uh, fine-tuned the uh, the so-called uh, uh, GPUs, right? And at some point, they realized that, look, they, are, they, they themselves can actually do the computation. Okay, graphics is one part of it, the intended application, but they can also do the computation. And that's where the GPUs came into picture. But one, the feature, one of the important characteristics of the GPUs ha is that they have thousands of uh, cores, as against something like what I told, 22 cores in the case of the Cascade Lake. Each processor has got 22 cores, okay? Some AMD processors have more number of cores and so on and so forth. They are details, okay? Maybe about 60 cores, 40 cores, 50 cores, whatever it is, okay? On the other hand, these have thousands of cores. Like if I'm talking about Ulta kind of a, um, a GPU, it has 3,000 cores. But the core of a GPU is not comparable with the core of a CPU. CPU core is a lot more powerful. Okay, but on the other hand, the GPU import the nicety of the GPU core is that there are so many of them. Okay, so uh, if I have uh, uh, identical tasks, okay, identical tasks to be done over many volumes in a CFD, okay, 
Now, what I do is that I send each one of these tasks through each one of the CPU, uh, GPU cores. Okay, so this is typically what is referred to as data parallel uh, kind of uh, environment. And therefore, what is important to note is that the challenge in distributed memory computing as against the so-called GPU-based computing is very different. And uh, what we make use of for achieving this parallelism in the GPU for the hyphen solver is called as open ACC. Okay. There is also yet another frame which is more popular, uh, 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 which is called as a CUDA-based uh, framework. We have not made use of. In case if somebody wants to know why we have not done that, I think we, I will also answer that. Uh, but at this point in time, considering the uh, uh, time constraint that we have for this talk, okay, I would say that uh, it is good enough to understand that we have uh, we have adopted a, a very popular and well-known MPI-based framework for the uh, distributed memory kind of uh, parallelism. And uh, for the GPU kind of parallelism, we have used the open ACC framework. And of course, uh, the most important thing that I would like to state about the solver is that it is robust. I am putting robust uh, in the first play, first slot, primarily because um, it, it's uh, intended to be an industrial solver. Okay, so although I belong to an academic institute, my interest is in algorithms. As a researcher, I work on um, do the algorithmic research, and all that experience that I have learned, we have put it in the hyphen solver. Okay, and that's an industrial solver, and that should be robust, accurate, efficient, and highly scalable. We have seen a lot of applications, aircraft and missile aerodynamic intake, aerodynamics, optimization, unsteady flow simulations, high lift physics, base flows. Okay. The recent MTech thesis that I was referring to was on base flows for what are called as single stage to orbit nozzles. Uh, uh, the the, uh, the uh, what, what they call as uh, uh, the SSTO kind of uh, applications, single stage to orbit. Okay, for, uh, we know that uh, you have multi-stage rockets, but uh, in future, we are most likely to have a one single stage, which will take me to space. Okay, so like the SpaceX program that people talk about. So uh, we should use some uh, special adaptive nozzles for uh, those kind of, uh, that kind of applications. And uh, what we have, my MTech student with about 200 million volumes and DES kind of calculation, what he has looked at is, such base flows. So basically, like, as I told you, like each one of the word that we have, I have put here, I think we have actually lived with it. Okay. Or something. Right. Okay. Now coming to the parallel stuff. Uh, uh, the issues are load balancing. I have talk, talked about it already. Okay, I have to sort of uh, equidistribute the computational loads to each one of the processor cores, minimize the communication overheads. Okay, I think it is uh, done through the, these two are done through Metis. And uh, there is also one more important feature that is expected from a CFD solver, but is referred to as algorithmic scalability. In fact, if you want to put to most of the commercial tools that you may be using to this test, they will fail this test. Okay, I can tell you, okay, you can try this yourself. Okay, you in whatever the more modest uh, parallel computing that is available to you, you can try this test. What is this algorithmic scalability? It is recovering a performance independent of the partition size. What it means is that I should uh, recover uh, say, for example, okay, I'm running a CFD code. I say that my code is converged. Okay, what does it mean? It means that I actually plot the residue versus iteration, and my residue actually has, uh, uh, you know, has uh, has converged to some value which is a specified value, 10 to the power of minus 4, 10 to the power of minus 6, 10 to the power of minus 8, some such value, okay? So what is typically the residue? It is actually the, uh, it is the time derivative term itself in some sense, okay? Del U over del T, which is what is the propensity for a change in a given volume, okay? So I say that my code is converged based on this residual convergence, okay? Now, what does algorithmic scalability mean? Okay, 
I may be running uh, a problem on a single core, okay, or 100 cores or 10,000 cores, okay. I should exactly, so if my, uh, if my calculations on all these three kind of setup, okay, where I have just one core, 100 core and 10,000 core. If my data dependencies are all exactly identical in all these three cases, my expectation is that my residue drop will also be identical, which means that when I'm plotting the residue against the iteration for each one of these runs, all of them will be falling on one another. Okay, this is what um, the idea of algorithmic trans uh, scalability translates to. Okay, now if you really uh, look at the parallel algorithms, okay, parallel algorithms that go with the flow solver, you would very quickly realize that this is not such an easy task. Okay. So you may end up in a scenario when you run the code on a single core or a hundred cores, your code may converge, but when you are running it on 10,000 core, your code will blob. Okay. It's a very distinct possibility. Okay. Then that, that is why the algorithms are very, very important. So you can very clearly see if you run your solver on different number of processor cores, your residual convergence will also start looking very differently. So that's the reason why algorithmic scalability is something which is very, very important. I can tell you that most of the commercial tools would not satisfy this. And generally, none of them, okay, name any commercial tool that is available, which is routinely being used in the uh, by the people. Uh, 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 they don't even scale well, okay, they don't even scale uh, uh, something like 200 cores or something like that. So whereas what we have done is scaled over uh, several thousand cores, 15,000, 20,000 cores, okay, and still uh, looking big, okay, looking for some big opportunities where we can demonstrate our scalability. So again, what is the kind of metal methodology that we have made use of in uh, Hyphen? We have used the um, uh, openly available uh, domain decomposition tool, Metis, which takes care of load balancing and the communication overheads. And we use a weighted graph. This is a bit of a detail. Let's not worry about it, right? Uh, so, uh, see, basically, when uh, I have, uh, uh, say, something like 10,000 or 15,000 cores, 10,000 or 15, so correspondingly, I will have about 10,000 or 15,000 domains, okay? Now, when I'm talking about a parallel algorithm, one of the integral parts of the parallel algorithm is establishing the communication cycle. Okay. Now, for example, if, uh, 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 say, core I is talking to core J. Okay. Now, at the same time, if I make core K also talk to core J, okay, what will happen is that the core K has to wait, okay, until the talking between core I and core J are complete, the core K will not be able to talk to core J, right? So essentially, when I have to establish my communication cycle, I have to establish it in such a way that, uh, that uh, 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 you know, if core i is talking to core j right no other core should in principle be talking to core j okay so in case if i do that what happens is that i lose out on my uh, uh, communication time okay so i lose out on my communication time and this is this may not be very significant if i am working with uh, 20 cores 30 cores or 100 cores on the other hand this aspect can become very critical in determining the computational efficiency if you have several thousand cores, 15,000, 20,000 cores. Okay. So, so now, <coughs> so establishing communication cycle essentially means pairing my processors. So basically, all the communication does not happen in one cycle. It happens in several cycles, but in each of the cycles, the processor cores will be paired in such a way that we minimize the bottlenecks. Okay, so this is what is a broad thumb rule, and this is an algorithm that we have actually developed. 
and the performance of the hyphen solver is very directly linked to this establishment of the communication cycle okay and then we use what is called as a non blocking communication uh, uh, communication i think uh, I'm, I'm i will skip that but in case if somebody interest is interested and he wants to ask a question i think i can come back to this and answer and we use what is referred to as a multi layered data i'm coming to this multi layered data okay so when i'm talking about the uh, uh, parallel algorithm for the hyphen solver right it's it's all about preparing my data okay so what you see here in uh, uh, in solid line is a domain okay is a sub domain what i call as a sub domain so calculations on this sub domain would go on a processor core so one of the key aspects of the success of the hyphen solver in terms of parallel computing is that we make use of a four layered data okay so i have uh, what are called as uh, the core cells okay so what do i mean by that these core cells are some kind of self sufficient cells okay they do not require data from other sub domains for solution to be updated in the core cells okay but you also have what are called as peripheral cells in a given sub domain the peripheral cells so the peripheral cells on the other hand require data from the neighboring sub domains okay it requires data from the neighboring sub domains right now of course when i am talking about the core cells right i said that it does not require uh, data from uh, other sub domains but if i am using something like an implicit solver again this is a bit of a technical information uh, uh, if somebody does not understand you can ignore it okay if i am using something like an implicit solver where there are global data dependencies even if i want to update the core cells i require information from the peripheral cells which in turn are dependent on the neighboring sub domains okay so uh, so whatever the parallel algorithm that we build should be in a position to sort of address this issue of global data dependencies associated with implicit solvers okay that's what is the challenge why i am particularly giving the example example of the implicit solvers because you cannot in the present day think of a solver uh, which is not a robust solver which is not implicit okay if you want a robust solver definitely it needs to be implicit okay right i think that's the idea now this is about the uh, data on that particular sub domain but there are also donor volumes which come on the neighboring sub domains okay so I, we also classify them as flux cells and state cells okay so what you see as uh, f is what is referred to as a flux cell s is a state cell so what it means is that the so called flux cells actually directly participate in the computation of the fluxes across the volume interface whereas when i am talking about the state cells their participation in solution update in a given domain is rather indirect it is enough that i make use of i i make available the states alone whereas in the case of flux cells the require become requirement becomes more stringent so this is broadly the 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 kind of a data structure that we make use of so you have the core cells then the peripheral cells core and the peripheral cells fall on the sub domain itself and then in the so called uh, uh, donor uh, sub domains you also have the classification of flux and state cells so this entire data preparation has to be done a priori before you are launch your, before you launch your problem on the supercomputing platform okay so the challenge is in preparing this data okay and preparing this data i think that's very very important so i would also say that this is also one of the important the way the data is actually the parallel data is prepared and used in case of hyphen is again one of the important reasons why it has been so successful in scaling okay apart from what i called as the communication cycle that's also very important okay 
Now, <coughs> this is again could be useful for those people who would want to assess the parallel performance of a solver. One minute. So, see, for somebody who want to assess the parallel performance of a solver, requirements could be very different. Okay. Uh, uh, so, for example, uh, I am a user of Cray. Okay. I am a user of Cray. I have a problem at hand. Okay. And uh, for an optimal utilization of the machine, what is the machine size I can use? Okay, because in Cray, I have about 30,000 cores. Okay, for, uh, for, for an optimal, uh, uh, I have a workload with about 100 million volumes. So there is a big question. If I have to optimally make use of this machine, should I make use of 1,000 cores, 10,000 cores, right? Or all the 30,000 cores? So if I have to answer this question, right? I would like to understand the parallel performance of the solver. Okay, so I require a metric for that purpose. Okay, why I am saying this is that the if the depending on the requirement of the user, the metric also would define would be different. Okay, number two is I want to procure one flow solver. Okay, and I want to procure the one which gives me better parallel for performance. Why better parallel for performance? Because I have a supercomputing platform. I want to make use of that computing platform optimally. Okay. So for me, I have to define some, quantify the parallelism for each of the solvers some way and then take the best. Okay. The one that gives the best scalability. So the metric there, what I talk about is different. Okay. Third one is that. I want to actually procure a computing platform itself, okay, right? And this, in fact, we when we procured Cray, I think we played a very important role in terms of the so-called benchmark studies, okay? We, we did an important role, played an important role in the benchmark studies. So it is very important to run our code and assess the kind of parallelism different machines give and accept the machine which gives you the best parallelism okay that's another way of so you require some other metric for that so essentially we need to first of all understand what is the requirement of the user okay whether he wants to decide the machine size whether he wants to compare to parallel solvers or whether he wants to compare to platforms okay so depending on the requirement you will also have different metric now i will uh, talk about the typical metrics that we have actually made use of. Okay, some of them are well established, some of them are metrics which we have introduced in the uh, parallel literature. Okay, first thing is ideal speed up. Okay, so I run my problem on 10 cores and I'm running my problem on 100 cores. So the ratio is 100 over 10, which is 10. So I expect my problem to be. 10 times faster okay so what i would do is to run the co so that's my expectation so i have 10 cores and 100 cores the expected uh, speed up i uh, is about 10 times so that's what is called as the ideal speed up actual speed up is i run my problem on 10 cores i also run my problem on 100 cores right and calculate the time per iteration for on when, when I run the problem on 10 cores and time per iteration when I run the problem on 100 cores, right? So I divide the first by the second time and that is going to give me this actual speed up, okay? Now the question is whether the actual speed up will be equal to ideal speed up, less than ideal speed up, more than ideal speed up. As I told you, general expectation, general expectation is that uh, when I'm actually, uh, the actual speed up should be less than the ideal speed up. Why should it be actually less than ideal speed up? Because when I am fragmenting the problem in, into more number of 
course associated you also have the communication coming into picture okay so there will be certain latencies associated with this uh, communication and finally and as a consequence of that general expectation is what happens in the case of hyphen we will show that but the general expectation is that the actual speed up will be less than the ideal speed up okay and thirdly this defines what is called as the parallel efficiency so essentially what you do you take the actual speed up to the ideal speed up that is what is called as the parallel efficiency and this parallel efficiency typically uh, will be less than 100% it could be 80% if a solve if the parallelism is good it could be 80% 90% uh, uh, if the parallelism is bad, it could be 20%, 30%. So this is another metric. Okay. So you have talked about three things which are very straightforward. One is the ideal speed up. Second one is the actual speed up. Third one is the parallel efficiency. Okay. The fourth one, which is what we have introduced, it is called as C count P. Okay. So literally translated, it is the minimum number of cells per core for ensuring a parallel efficiency of p per second okay so i what i do is in order to define my c count i define a threshold parallel efficiency i say that i require about 85 percent parallel efficiency so i ask the question what is the minimum number of cells per core okay what is the minimum number of cells per core that is required for ensuring this parallel efficiency okay so this is a very very important uh, uh, parameter and then the fifth one is called as the machine performance parameter okay so uh, uh, machine performance parameter literally translates as this is again a, a metric that we have introduced ratio of product of time per 100 iterations and the number of cores employed in the scalability run to the grid size in million volumes okay literally what we do is that let's suppose that we have 100 million volumes okay 100 million volumes right we take the time for 100 iterations right some seconds and i also take the total number of cores that i have made use of multiply the time for 100 iterations with the number of cores that I have made use of. So this is the total core hour, core, core seconds that you have actually used. Okay. Total number of core seconds. Okay. So a core second is that if a one core computes for one second, that's a core second. So basically, if I take the time in seconds for 100 iterations and multiply with the total number of cores that I have made, maybe I have made use of 10,000 cores, multiply it. So that is what is the total number of core seconds that I have made use of and divide it by the total grid size that I have used in million volumes. Okay. So this is what is called as the machine performance parameter. So if I am a user of the first kind, let's suppose, okay, I'm using a, um, I want to find out the optimal machine size. Okay. What is the, what is the, um, uh, uh, metric that I would use of, make use of, I will make use of something like parallel efficiency. Okay. I, the metric that I would make use of is parallel efficiency. Right. On the other hand, if I am a user of the second class, uh, second class, okay, I want to compare the parallel performance of two solvers on a given machine. Okay. Want to compare the parallel performance of two different solvers on a given machine. Right. What, what would I make use of? The C count. Okay. So the solver, which gives me 85% parallel efficiency, but with a smaller number of volumes on a core is the one which is better. Okay. Smaller the C count, better it is. Okay. Okay. Larger the parallel efficiency, better it is. Whereas on the other hand, smaller the C count, and it is better it is. Machine performance parameter is essentially, it is the time taken for a computation okay right so i have different computing platforms with different mpps the so called machine performance parameters right the one that is smallest 
is the best machine because I have the same same code, same number of cores that I have actually employed on each one of these machines. And I find out the time per 100 iterations and then calculate the MPP. The one that is fastest, OK, would be the best. OK, so essentially, if I want to compare two computing platforms, then I would require machine performance parameter. So this is what is the, uh, the, the metric that we have actually used. So the first three ones, ideal, actual, and the actual sp ideal speed of actual speed up and parallel efficiency are well known in literature. But as far as the C count and the machine performance parameter are concerned, these are introduced by us. Okay. Now, I, 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 I'll present the Sahasrath experience. Sahasrath is the Cray XC40 machine. Okay. It has got about 1,376 nodes. And each node has uh, Intel Xeon uh, Haswell processors, okay, 2.5 giga gigahertz, and uh, 12 core dual socket, 128 GB uh, RAM. Each of, this is the node specification, okay, right? And uh, it has got an Aries uh, interconnect. Aries interconnect is one of the very well known interconnects uh, worldwide, right? Uh, the dragonfly topology you can ignore that right and uh, it has got a uh, storage of uh, storage unit of two petabyte okay right so this is about the parallel machine so this is uh, what is there in our uh, supercomputing complex scrc okay now what you see here is uh, the performance of the hyphen solver on the Sahasrath, the Cray XC40 machine. Okay. So these are typically the high lift flow simulations, which I have shown. For this kind of uh, uh, see parallel uh, performance study, we have made use of a grid, different grids. When one is about 36, uh, 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 38 million volumes, and the other one is about 165 million volumes. I will give you data for both. Okay. Uh, 38 million, 38 or 30, 39 million volumes, right? And uh, while calculating the speed up, see the problem is that if you have 38 million volumes, it's not possible to run it on one single core. So basically, you need to define some kind of a reference number of cores, okay? Uh, so you scale with respect to the data associated with that core, okay? So the reference number of cores that I have made use of for uh, for the the reference number of cores that I have actually made use of uh, for this problem is about 64 cores. Okay, so you can see the speed up, which is the actual speed up. As of course, the ideal speed up is also shown here, right? This uh, violet line, actual speed up. For uh, I think uh, we have made use of till something like 14,000 cores. Okay. The Sahasrath, the Cray XC40 itself has got about uh, a little over 30,000 cores. Mm -hmm. So only this portion of the machine was made available to us for the scalability studies, right? Now, uh, so this line, right, the violet one, is what is the, uh, the ideal speed up, right? Now, when I was talking about uh, the actual speed up, I said that general expectation is that the actual speed up should be less than the ideal speed up. Okay. But, but uh, see in this particular graph is that as the number of cores are increasing, okay, the speed up, uh, actual speed up is actually more than the ideal speed up. Okay. So, how is this possible? Okay. Now, uh, uh, the, the reason why this happens is that. When I am actually fragmenting the problem into more and more number of uh, processor cores, right? The uh, see when I am talking about the memory associated with a processor core, there are different layers of memory. Okay, so you have the cache, and within the cache itself, you have uh, L1 cache, L2 cache, L3 cache, and then you have the RAM. Okay, so essentially, what happens? is that when I am fragmenting the problem into more number of processor cores, the memory requirement per core becomes lesser and lesser. And as a consequence of this, 
the memory resides on the cache itself okay so if i am talking about the memory access time between the cache and the ram the cache is much faster okay so what happens is that when i am actually mapping the problem on more number of processor cores right on one hand you also have to do more communication okay but on the other hand you have the benefit in terms of cache utilization okay so these are more like contradicting kind of um, um, uh, scenario so the better cache utilization would make the code faster and more communication because you have mapped the problem on more number of cores would make the problem go slower right so in this particular problem what happens is that or in this particular uh, 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 example that i'm showing what happens is that the cache utilization the benefit of cache utilization seems to be overwhelming okay that's the reason why you see performance better than ideal speed up the actual speed up is better than ideal speed up okay but does this continue forever no when i'm actually running it on 14000 cores i immediately see that the communication becomes dominant so basically for some part of the uh, 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 some number of uh, subdomains okay the cache utilization actually becomes beneficial but for even more when i am actually scaling up the problem even further the communication becomes dominant and the efficiency falls okay so correspondingly when i am looking at the parallel efficiency you can see very clearly that till about 8000 cores my parallel efficiency is more than 100% and later on it drops to something like 80 85% okay now there are also a few other things that i would like to state with regard to this particular view graph okay state particularly with regard to this particular view graph now when i am looking at it you can very clearly see that these experiments were done using two different compilers one is a cray compiler other one is an internal compiler uh, on different dates okay so what i have tried to bring in is that uh, you know this is also something to do about the quality of the machine that we have at hand you can very clearly see that the machine become machine gives more or less consistently the same kind of performance on different dates and different compilers okay this is something good about the machine the sahasrat sahasrat machine that we have except for this one uh, one one point okay where uh, for some strange reason the performance was not achievable okay this is corresponding to the uh, black curve you can see that suddenly there is a drop actually map part of the machine it, it can get mapped to different part of the machine and these are expected okay these are expected but, but overall you can see that the machine gives a consistent performance okay so now again when i'm saying that we are able to get achieve uh, parallel efficiency is more than 100 percent what is key to this para high high parallel efficiency the key to this parallel efficiency is that the memory footprint the code lives per core is very small okay right and that, that is the reason why we are able to sort of draw benefit out of better cache utilization so for example if our memory footprint was very large okay memory what is the typical memory footprint we have uh, per million volumes it is about a gb okay so typically actually it is less than a gb it is less than it is about 700 mb or something like that okay so what i want to tell you is that the as far as a hyphen solver is concerned we have designed the solver in such a way its memory footprint is very small and as a consequence of that we are able to sort of uh, exploit the cache utilization and then achieve high scalability okay so this is how the c count like for example uh, uh, when i talked about the c count I'm sorry when i talked about the c count we talk about the minimum number of cells okay so now we are talking about 
uh, 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 like let's go here to this graph we are talking about 85 percent parallel efficiency okay so essentially we have about 40 million volumes so you divide the 40 million volumes 40 million volumes by about 14,000 cores because that's what is giving you that 85 percent efficiency okay 14,000 cores right and uh, and sorry so so the minimum number of uh, cells per per ending a parallel so that's what is going to be so you divide for, you divide sorry 14 uh, 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 the the, the uh, the, the 39 million volumes by about 14,000 cores, will, you will get that C count. Okay, for this, typically, what is the C count for uh, other solvers? I will also make a mention of this. But so uh, it is, it, it's very important to note that a good solver should have a small memory footprint if it has to exploit the parallelism in the machine. Okay, now you have the other example with about. Uh, 165 million uh, volumes, same flow, which is what is the, uh, the view graph that I had uh, shown uh, during the early part of my talk, right? And in this case, the reference uh, number of cores is about 256. And you can see that the ideal speed up is by the given by the red line. And by and large, you can see that when I'm having 165 cores uh, uh, till about 14,000 cores, uh, by and large, for most of the runs that we have had, we have a yeah, super linear scalability, meaning my actual speed up is better than the speed up of uh, the ideal speed up. Okay, and as a consequence, our efficiency is much more than hundred percent. So people, when they talk about uh, the scalability, right? They talk about uh, uh, super linearity. Super linearity in the sense like you get a yeah, scalability better than the linear scalability uh, associated with a ideal. Uh, ideal expectation okay so what i would say is that the kind of scalability the hyphen solver gives is a hyper linear scalability you know much more than super linear scalability okay you get parallel efficiency is like 200 percent okay so if you really and and the problem size is about 165 million volumes 165 million volumes on 14,000 cores this problem size itself is actually quite small right if you look at some of the commercial solvers, they will require anything like 500 million volumes to scale on uh, something like 500 cores or uh, some uh, 500 uh, cores or something like that, right? Or, or I'm sorry, the uh, uh, or 500 million volumes to score scale on something like uh, 15,000 cores, right? Right? It may not be 500 million volumes. It could be even a billion volume to scale on 15,000 cores and then give you parallel efficiency of about 85%. Okay, so it is very important that uh, we, we we should have our algorithms right in order to speed the scalability. Okay, coming to the C count. So this is where I have uh, actually presented the C count for the uh, the hyphen solver, right? Right. So you can see we have used the hyphen solver on different machines. The example that I have given was only for Cray, but we have also run it on a NASA Pleiades machine. Right. Uh, 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 I don't know uh, if uh, anybody has seen the movie Martian. There is a reference to this NASA Pleiades machine. So we have actually done our scalability study on this NASA Pleiades machine. There is also an Endeavor machine which is available with the Intel. So we have also done it. And uh, long back in 2009, uh, there was a uh, uh, something like uh, 100 teraflop, a little over 100 teraflop uh, parallel computing platform at Pune, uh, 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 which was managed by Tata Sons. It used to be called as ICA. Okay. So over this period, in fact, the C count, we have this problem size of 38.6 million volumes. We have retained it as the same. And on ICA, the C count was about 18,000 cores. And Intel Endeavor, it's about 3,300 uh, 3, cores. NASA Pleiades is about 7,500 cores. And again on Cray, it's about 2,700 cores. Okay, so you can see that the the hyphen solver uh, C count is uh, you know you require some like 
3,000 or 4,000 cores per see the volumes per core. Okay, right. On the other hand, uh, 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 typically in any commercial solver, uh, you know, uh, it is not about uh, 1,000 cores, but you may require something like a million volumes on a core. Okay, a million volume, half a million volume on a core in order to experience this 85% efficiency. Okay, so hyphen is hyper efficient as compared to most of the commercial tools that we know uh, know of. Okay, so uh, in fact, quite uh, quite uh, very quite obviously, none of these commercial guys will put their scalable uh, the scalability and parallel performance in black and white as we have actually put. So what we use is called as strong scalability. Okay. And again, there is something on the machine performance parameter. I think I will come to, I think there's one more graph that is there coming. I, this is what is that. Okay. So I'm also giving you the machine performance parameter. So basically, um, if you can recall, the machine performance parameter is required for comparing two machines. Okay. Right. Compare one machine against that one that gives the machine performance smaller machine performance parameter is the best. Okay, so typically you can see that uh, the machine performance parameter associated uh, with Cray is about uh, three thousand, whereas with Ika it is about six thousand eight hundred. So obviously when I compare Ika, which is a two thousand nine machine, as against the two thousand fifteen machine, which is Cray, right? You can see that Cray is actually. Uh, almost more than twice better than Ika, right? It is more than it is uh, more than twice better than Ika, right? So this is what is actually seen in this particular graph where we have plotted the machine performance parameter against the number of cores, and you can see very clearly that Cray has got a machine performance parameter of about uh, three thousand. So there is also a reason why the code uh, the curves behave like that for the lack of time. I am skipping that. But uh, if somebody is interested, I think uh, we can, I can put them, put him on some literature where they can understand these things better. Okay. So this is about the machine performance parameter, and finally the algorithmic scalability. This is what I told. Most of the uh, uh, commercial guys would not show this. Okay. So I am plotting the residue convergence uh, against iteration for different number of processor cores: 256, 4096. 8192 14000 okay right and similarly the force and the drag coefficient how it evolves with iteration right so you can very clearly see that uh, hyphen gives a residue fall about 8 decades and not just that you can very clearly see for practically there is no difference at all all the residue curves fall on one another okay so we have ensured in our algorithm that hyphen gives a very good algorithmic scalability. Similarly, the force coefficient evolution. So this is what is referred to typically as residual convergence, and this is what is referred to as iterative convergence. So near independent, uh, uh, near independence uh, with respect to number of cores that you have. Uh, in a course that you have actually made use of in the computations for both residual and the iterative convergence and this is what this speaks about the algorithm al algorithmic scalability of the iphone solver okay uh, so there are also other things that i can actually talk about but i